so much, Kit, and thank, thank you, Vincent, for that very interesting question. Um, I'm going to um, suggest that we move on to the next talk now. So again, thanks, Kit, that's brilliant. What I would say is that Kit has very kindly agreed um, to join us for the discussion at the end. So um, any more specific questions um, for Kit can be raised then. Um, but now, without further ado, I'd like to move on to our next talk, which is the last one before the discussion. And this is a talk by Sebastian Funk from LSA. HTM, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, Sebastian is going to talk about integrated disease models that account for behavioural factors progress since the nine challenges paper. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, always nice to be given a, a title by someone else so you don't have to um, think about a catchy one yourself. Um, the, so I've been asked to um, reflect on progress um, since we wrote a paper that itself came out of a um, Newton Institute workshop now six, six seven years ago, um, a, a several week program, where we came up with these um, challenge papers. And one of them was this, um, let's go to the next slide, yeah. Um, not this one, but this one, um, on incorporating dynamics of behavior in infectious disease models. And um, I guess the, the sort of happy story now would be if I had spent the last six years working on this and addressing most of them, but in fact, I haven't. In fact, I, I uh, haven't recently been working on uh, behavior in infectious diseases. And so I speak of this largely as a bit of an outsider and my views on this will be necessarily incomplete and subjective and apologies to anyone whose work I might have been uh, might be missing in my subjective assessment of it. Before talking about the specific challenges that we posed, I just want to highlight another paper and an opinion piece that was published uh, 10 years or almost 10 years earlier uh, by Neil Ferguson on capturing human behavior. And if you look at the subtitle, um, understanding the dynamics of infectious disease transmission demands a holistic approach, yet today's models largely ignore how epidemics change individual behavior, then this still holds very much true, I think. So um, 15 years later, I don't think um, this is something that has changed much. If you think about the models that have really influenced policy and the, the models that, for example, in the UK have influenced policy, there is no element there of epidemics changing individual behavior. It's not to say that there's more work having been done, and I think Kit showed a really interesting example of that earlier. But I think, the, again, the, the models that have been used for policy haven't um, uh, addressed this. I, I, I highly recommend looking at this essay. I think um, looking better at this, uh, at it, 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 to me, it uh, really reads remarkably prescient. Coming back to our challenges, and what I'll do is I'll just go through these one by one and uh, tr try to give my view on uh, where we are with this, and specifically where we are with this with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic, because obviously this has kind of um, really been an event that has been shaped by individual behavior, and uh, but also one where maybe this it, it kind of gives a useful reference point for uh, whether these challenges really uh, still exist and whether they've been addressed or whether they still are open challenges or whether they still are useful challenges to address potentially in the future. And uh, I won't do them in order, I, I largely do them in order, but I want to start with two that I think are maybe the most important ones. And I want to, and the first one is one where I think there's been a really positive story and that is to inform real-time data collection. And um, there's, a, uh, I think, a very nice example of this, which is the COMIC study, which was started in the UK, but has since expanded to a range of European countries, um, funded large, largely by EU money. And uh, so it's this idea that in uh, mathematical models of infectious diseases, if you have an age-structured models, you need some kind of um, uh, quantitative idea of how people of different age groups come in contact with each other. And this generally tends to change the amount of, or the kind of how people come in contact with each other tends to change over the course of an epidemic. And so one way 
to be able to reliably inform models with it is to measure it. And so the COMIC study, which uh, actually uh, those of you who were at the session on Tuesday would have heard about it then from Amy Jimmer, um, is, is a study that on a weekly basis does exactly this. So it, it really, it's really model informed um, data collection where every week a key set of parameters that is that informs mathematical models, age structured mathematical models of infectious disease transmission is measured to um, mathematical models. A second point um, that I think is, is really relevant and relevant maybe to the broader discussion of modeling behavior in pandemics is on how and to what extent behavior should be modeled explicitly. And what we mean by or what we meant back then by explicitly is reflected in this distinction between exogenous and endogenous modeling of behavior. So um, starting with exogenous, so I just mentioned um, COMICS, and this is another um, plot from the COMICS study of how contacts changed over the course of the pandemic. And um, so with exogenous modeling of behavior, we observe some kind of behavior and then we integrate this in a mathematical model. So this is exactly what I just described is kind of, for example, we, we observe or we measure contact matrices and then we can integrate them in the mathematical model. It doesn't mean that we can explain behavior. It also means that we don't really have a model for behavior, but we have a way in which observed behavior can enter a mathematical model of infectious disease transmission. And um, there's there have by now been various examples of how this, uh, how this is being done with this. Other models have used things like um, mobility data, again, something that was talked about earlier today, to inform how behavior changes and something that can then enter a mathematical model as a parameter affecting transmission intensity. The other way of thinking about this is if we model behavior explicitly. So this is a bit like um, in the previous talk by um, Kate Yates, where the infection itself generated behavior, behavioral dynamics was modeled and behavior itself then can affect the epidemic again. So this is something that uh, we, for example, with um, Vincent, who's also here, Vincent Janssen, uh, and others modeled um, a while ago where, so this is idea where here you have an outbreak in red and then the current where the outbreak currently is, is in light red. And you have this cloud of awareness or information around it that in itself can can uh, stop the epidemic, but then you can have these outbreaks again, the, the uh, uh, kind of breakthrough of infection, and then people react to it again and mitigate the outbreak. And um, so you have the, the behavior itself as part of the mechanistic and, and dynamic process. I'm not aware of any models of this sort that have been used to explain any of the observed behavior in uh, in in COVID nineteen in a kind of data linked way, so I, I haven't seen any models uh, where, for example, this changes change in contact where contacts change sometimes in response to policy, but also sometimes uh, not in response to policy, where this could be explained by what is going on with the um, epidemic, and as a consequence, it's really hard to predict changes in COVID nineteen case trends. So um, this is one example from the European COVID-19 Forecast Hub, where um, forecasts from a range of modeling teams are being collected and integrated and, on, and uh, an ensemble created every week. What you see here are one week ahead forecasts. You see the data in black, and then the forecasts made each week in um, what is this? Cyan. And what you can see is that whenever there's a change in trend, so the models are kind of all right at continuing an existing trend, but whenever there's a change in trend, the models tend to fail to see it. And this is because to this date, in now coming up to two years, and we kind of see similar things elsewhere in, in, in other countries and in other settings where similar efforts exist, um, forecasting trends in cases of COVID-19 is really difficult. And the reason for that is that we have no real leading indicators. And if you think of the previous slide where I showed kind of contacts changing over time, um, we can we, we don't really, I mentioned there, we don't have any models, any mechanisms that would explain why those contacts change or how they change. And so when a change happens and when uh, via some 
um, uh, well, for, ever, for whatever reason, contact behavior changes, we don't have good models for that. Um, and that brings me then to going through the, the, the uh, remaining challenges. And uh, so the one, the, the first one that we set out was to set a baseline and determine the effect from depart of departing from it. And what we meant by this is that there's some kind of behavior that is kind of, um, well, to, to model behavioral change, you need to know what baseline behavior is. And we often observe behavior in the absence of disease. And so one example of a baseline behavior is what people do when they're ill. And if we measure contacts in healthy people, this that might not tell us much about relevant contacts in those that are infected and infectious. And so this is one example from uh, 2013, from the 2009 H1N1 pandemic in the UK, where uh, again, in, in another study, um, contacts were um, monitored at two different or at, at, at several time points, including in those that had uh, currently were showing symptoms and those that weren't. And you can see that the contacts declined in those showing symptoms. And in fact, we, uh, I mean, this is obviously something that we know happens in COVID-19 because of contact tracing. And we very recently had a very striking example of the effect that that has when the um, uh, Imensa scandal happened and one, one lab in the UK was falsely reporting uh, or falsely assessing um, coronavirus infected, very likely coronavirus infected people as negative. And we can see that in, these, in the areas where this happened um, predominantly, um, cases increase to a much larger degree than in surrounding regions where it didn't happen. So you can see real epidemic effects of, of this and obviously contact tracing uh, has had an effect on the epidemic throughout. So, but still to, to assess the effect of something like contact tracing, we would need to know what the baseline is and what, um, uh, what people would do in the absence of any intervention. And I don't think this is something that we really do for COVID-19. And in fact, in COVID-19, it's also really important for assessing um, the impact of policies. So, if, and uh, you're probably all aware, there have been huge discussions around um, uh, COVID-19 and lockdown policy and whether lockdown was necessary. And the question is always, what would people have done if it hadn't been for lockdowns? And I don't think we have a good handle on this, partly because um, in, in all the settings where we have collected data on um, contact behavior, such as in the UK, usually the, um, uh, the, the, the epidemic was mitigated through lockdown or um, related policies. And so we haven't, mercifully in this case, observed an unmitigated epidemic. I think some parts of the world that have seen un uh, unmitigated epidemics, um, we don't ha really have those observations of behavior, so we can't really relate those. We might have some ideas of it, but I don't think we have a good quantitative understanding of how this, how this um, uh, happens. The, um, we talked about the, the, the back then we, we um, were trying to assess the minimal level of detail required to model differences in behavior. I don't have really much to add on this for COVID-19, especially because um, we haven't really got good, model, good models of behavior with respect to COVID-19. Um, there is a question, so we can't really, we're not very good at, well, haven't been very good at predicting population level or modeling population level behavior. And so um, whether this is easier or possible at a more detailed or individual level, um, I, I don't know, but it seems this continues to be an unanswered question. Um, we talked about quantified changes in reporting behavior, something that's really important for interpreting data. And again, this is something where I think there's been some positive uh, development in uh, COVID-19, and especially in the UK, where we, had, where we have had the ONS study of randomized community testing, that has been a real, a, 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 such an important part of situational awareness for the current state of the pandemic in the UK, um, where through testing uh, random households, we we get a sort of we get a measure of COVID nineteen prevalence through time that is unbiased by um, testing capacity or individual behavior with respect to uh, seeking out a test when uh, infectious. And so we can compare this to the, to the self-initiated testing. This is just a case data over time, sort of trying to match these roughly in time. 
And if you divide one by the other, you get some estimate of the proportion of people with symptoms that came forward for a test. Now with this, now we can quantify this and we can, we can, we can look at this, but we have the same problem that we had before when I mentioned the uh, changes in contact behavior, which is that we observe changes in trend over time, but we don't really have good explanations for why they happened and why people may have had, um, uh, if that is the interpretation of this, if people had different predispositions of coming forward for a test with symptoms, um, why that would have been the case over time. Again, which is what we would really need to do in order to really understand this. Um, we said then that one challenge with respect to behavior was uh, to predict the responses to interventions and health campaigns. So another very pertinent um, issue with respect to the pandemic and um, something that we've seen is that the same intervention, so I'm just putting an example here of one paper where this was examined in great detail uh, and where it was found that the same intervention can have very different effects at different times when applied in the same place. It can also have very different effects in different places when applied at the same time. And again, it's something that I don't think, um, at least at the modeling community, we don't have a good handle on. Um, we, we talked about identifying the role of movement of and travel as a challenge. And this, I think, is something where uh, actually through the wide availability of movement data, there has been quite a lot of really informative work um, in the pandemic, both in terms of both some very nice work by Kramer and others on the early dispersal of COVID-19 in China, and then uh, quite recently, really nice work on the spread of early SARS coronavirus to in uh, early in the pandemic in Europe, and uh, the huge scale up of the availability of pathogen genomic data has also helped with this. So I think we um, really can say that there's been real progress in understanding the role of movement and travel in um, uh, well at least in early on in the pandemic, which is obviously um, uh, quite a crucial period for understanding the pandemic. We also talked about developing models that can be verified against data from digital sources. And um, what we were particularly highlighting was the need to kind of use um, things like social media data or explore the use of social media data for better understanding infectious disease transmission. That is something where I'm not aware of any significant contribution having been uh, of, of these kind of data sources having made any sig significant contribution during the pandemic, at least at least not beyond the already mentioned movement data. Um, uh, so such as here, so this is a kind of Google mobility data that's been used by a lot of models for understanding, uh, or for not for understanding, but for um, uh, capturing and quantifying changes in behavior. So um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of kind of tracing, um, uh, tracing individuals' behavior, there's been the, 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 the um, kind of the, the, the way this kind of data has made a contribution to modeling the epidemic was through mobility data and much less through um, social media data, such as, I don't know, following Twitter uh, texts or other things, which, which I think some time ago was seen as a very promising avenue. It's, it's I mean, it's sort of interesting to, to reflect on um, Google flu trends and how that was seen as revolutionary at the time, or at least sold as revolutionary at the time. Nothing of that sort has cropped up during the pandemic, really. The last one and a really important one, I think, is was the, the, the plea that we put out for engaging in a dialogue across disciplines. Uh, and uh, I was sort of uh, a small affiliation or a small involvement in a recent, uh, much more comprehensive view on this, which I uh, recommend looking at and engaging with. I thought it was a very nice, broad perspective on this idea of engaging, uh, of modelers engaging not just with um, clinicians and, and broader epidemiologists, but also with um, social scientists to, to better understand how behavioral or social parameters could be integrated in models and have some kind of feedback loop 
in that I think that still remains the kind of if if one wants to do this properly that still remains the the, the ideal way of doing it even if um, really not done commonly in practice at least in my um, uh, as far as I as far as I'm aware. So these were the nine challenges. Um, pretty quick tour through these and how I think they've been they've played out in the in the pandemic. What we can conclude is that on the one hand, um, there's certainly been some progress within that. Uh, contrary to previous outbreaks and and epidemics, I think uh, there has been positive change in that data collection has been informed by models. I think um, that's may, still may be far from perfect, but I think it has really, that has really been a positive contribution. On the other hand, um, we don't really, we haven't really learned how to model behavior in the pandemic. And so uh, as a consequence, we don't really have any way of predicting what's going to happen. And um, we, we haven't seen the emergence of these kind of endogenous behavioral components in models that inform policy. And so I think the open challenges remain um, well, whether we can change that, and maybe we can't, and maybe that is the answer to the question of the whether we um, model behavior endogenous, endogenously or exogenously, maybe we can't go beyond kind of um, uh, understanding kind of very broad um, uh, kind of theoretical um, interactions between behavior and and disease, and and maybe that is all the value we can get, and 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 that and there's obviously value in that in, it, in itself, as uh, again referring to the previous talk, which I thought really nicely illustrated some of these um, uh, some of these relationships. And I think as a general challenge to the field, so this is a um, actually a, a quote from a talk that I gave uh, ten years ago, and I don't think um, I've seen an answer, a positive answer to that, which is. You know, is there anything? Are there any patterns in in observed infectious disease dynamics that we can only understand, or that we can better understand by including a behavioral model? I think that uh, remains a main challenge. And uh, with that, I conclude. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Sebastian. That's that's really really um, uh, interesting. And um, I can already see some stuff coming up in the chat um i don't know if you can access that um, um of kit uh yates has got a hand up so kit do you want to oh, no i was uh, i was applauding jane sorry sorry i was applauding sorry oh it was an applause right, okay there you are you've, you've had some you've had some applause there um sebastian so yeah there, there were some points made in the chat um samuel mentioned about google tried to do a flu model based on scraping data from Twitter, social media, not sure what happened to that. And then um, there's some comments around that. But this looks more like a question here um, from William. Is making concrete predictions the only way to inform policy? Yeah, very much not. And I think, I mean, that's an excellent question um, and uh, uh, maybe a challenge to something I stated slightly too provocatively in the end. Um, but I think it's, I think what remains, I think there, there are two main ways of informing policy. One is to improve our understanding and one is by, one is to make predictions. And uh, I don't think either of these has really been addressed with respect to better understanding the, um, the pandemic. Okay, thank you. So, um, do I have any more questions then, please? Please do show your hand or or pop them into chat. Flavio. Uh, thanks, Sebastian. I think that that was a really fantastic talk uh, and it's also setting up nicely for tomorrow's session that we're going to talk about many of these things. So I uh, I, um, I actually did not know about this challenges paper uh, and, and it kind of begs the question, uh, if, if people have known that there are these shortcomings for so long, why do you think there's been so little progress in, in trying to incorporate these, um, these uh, behavioral aspects more, more, more tightly into the, the models? I mean, I think th there's, a, there's a thick irony here that, that the paper you showed in Nature was from, from Ferguson, who, who, who is one of the of driving forces of, of the models we've been using during at least the early stages of the epidemic. Uh, 
I, I mean, I, I, I know it's a little bit, you know, playing the devil's advocate, but he should know better. So, so what? I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying he is, is an obvious thing how to do it, but there must, you must, must have made some, some thoughts about why, why there's so, such slow progress. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the simple answer is because it's really hard. And, and I think it, it is really hard. And it's also perhaps not to be underestimated just what a singular event this pandemic is. And so behavior might be more, you know, maybe that's the hardest, hardest question, really, the one that I focus on in this, in this, in this talk is, is how to do this for a novel pandemic. And, and, you know, it, maybe there is a, 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 a maybe a greater role or maybe it's easier a, a problem that's easier to address is is individual behavior how individual behavior shapes annual flu epidemics or something that's you know maybe maybe less less affected by policy changing policy i mean there's just been so much interacting in the in the pandemic that i think i to me i don't think it's for lack of um uh, appreciation that this is something that should be done i think it's more because it's really hard and also because um you know maybe sometimes we're lacking the data although arguably in this case the data is there but and it, it, maybe it's just still really hard thank you sebastian um ed has his hand up now yeah thank you thank you sir that that's really really nice talk and that's more a general theme overarching theme to this question is regarding like social media and I suppose like and things like Google flu trends is ultimately how much could we feasibly actually learn from such platforms given social media sphere itself is dynamic and changing over time and thinking about there's different generational uptakes and there's like newcomers on onto that scene quite frequently and so in a, in a sense with the speed of with that time scale where the social media sphere is kind of updating itself if we try and learn from it are we always going to be behind in some to some extent and therefore it's is it other data streams therefore it's like we should be prioritizing these data streams as these will be perhaps more robust longer term versus all oh, right social media we have all lots of data so that can surely give us some answer yeah perhaps a broader broader level question well i think you answered it yourself no i think it's it's probably true what you're saying is that it's 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 um you know it's difficult and and i mean one of the um i think one of the reasons for example google mobility data has been used so much is because it was made available in an easily quantified um format whereas working with social media data maybe it's been more um messy um and 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 difficult because of that and I mean, I remember there was some nice work um, many years ago on differences in vaccination uptake for, I think, was it measles or flu in the US and some, some relationship with, I mean, so Twitter messages were analyzed in different states for, for um, sentiment expressed in them towards vaccines and then some correlation was found between that and, um, uh, and true vaccine uptake. I don't know if anyone's tried to do that for COVID. Maybe that would be possible, but I think it's also, again, and, you know, it's, it's it's difficult and requires sophisticated methods. Turning over a lot of data that I think by now has become quite costly, because also the um, social media companies are not allowing access to data as it used to be. Yeah, it was Marcel Sartre's work exactly. Um, so uh, that might be another reason. Thanks very much, Sebastian. Um, Samuel has got um, his hand up, and what I would suggest is that after we've dealt with Samuel's question, we might want to move into the wider challenges because um, um, Sebastian um, has also very kindly agreed to stay on for the discussion. So there's plenty of time for that. And I would just quickly say that um, Julia has very helpfully um, posted in chat the link to the challenges paper, which, as she points out, was part of Special Issue of Epidemics in 2015 following the uh, 2013 INI program. So that is in the chat, so you can follow the link. So Samuel, please do ask your question. Yeah, so it's a sort of, sort of question and maybe bleeds into the discussion because uh, a sort of challenge that I think 
it's relevant to what you're saying, Seb, um, that you maybe didn't include is that also, I don't think epi models had ever really been asked to do what they're being asked to do now, which is this sort of sequential um, now and near casting. Um, and so a, a lot of the stuff, so sort of maybe slightly addressing Flavio's point as well, uh, a lot of the stuff in the social dynamics sphere is a lot like, well, if there was a pandemic, there would be some, the people would reduce their mobility, but there was never a belief that there would be things like vaccines that would come in less than one year. And so there, there was always a feeling that this would be, that you could have something where there was like a temporary perturbation early on in a pandemic, but eventually people would sort of go back to normal and like your long-term forecast would probably all converge onto a similar place. And this idea that, you know, you're going to be asked, what is the hospitalizations next week and the week after? And the policymakers want you to be right every single week. And the, the things have showed up about like, you know, you really should be tracing how accurate your near-term forecasts are. That sphere was not even being asked. And, and to that's like a sphere of accuracy where you need to be really on it with the social mobility as well. And it was kind of like, although Seb is a real, was, is basically, he, he's too modest, but he's a visionary on this stuff. Because um, <laughs> I remember being in talks like 10 years ago, I was just like, nah, no, we'll never need to know epidemics in that detail, uh, which Seb was giving. Um, yeah, so it, it's not just how difficult the question is. It's like, I don't think people were expecting to be asked such finely resolved questions about the modeling. It was more like kind of big picture kind of things. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Samuel. Um, um, and, and thank you again to Sebastian and all our other wonderful speakers this afternoon. I, I'm, I'd like to hand over now to our Q&A discussion chairs, um, Ed Hill and Flavio Toxvard again, um, to lead the discussion. Okay.